Jennifer DeVillis. Welcome. She's a geologist with groundwater and is with the Wellhead Protection Coordinator of the Department of Environment and Energy. And Marty has a new title, Environmental Director with the Hastings Utilities. So welcome both of you. Go right ahead. Thanks. Thanks so much for having us. I appreciate it. Um, so let me make sure that I can share my screen here. I think. I think I need to move to my other. There we go. Can everyone see my first slide? Yes. That's it. Okay. Look good. Okay, great. Okay, so thanks for the intro, Belva. So like Belva said, I am a groundwater geologist at uh, Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy. Um, and so I grew up, I'm a Nebraska native. I grew up in Eagle, Nebraska, which is just east of Lincoln. Um, went to UNL for geology and then um, took a job in Denver for a medium sized independent oil and gas company right after graduation and was out there um, for about six years and bounced from oil and gas into environmental remediation geology, which is essentially cleaning up um, oil spills around gas stations and stuff like that in the subsurface. Um, and so water has actually always been my passion. So when I saw that this job had opened up back in Nebraska, working with groundwater, it was kind of a no brainer. Um, so I've only been with the state since August of last year. So just a little over a year now. Um, and I've definitely hit the ground running. So there's been a lot going on and it seems like, you know, just with COVID hitting too, it's just a never ending learning experience. So um, a little bit about my presentation. My presentation is pretty geology and groundwater heavy. So what Marty and I are kind of planning on is I'm just gonna give you a little broad overview of kind of what um, my work entails and kind of an idea of how things are moving in the subsurface. And then Marty has a lot of great detailed information, you know, about the work that y'all are doing in Hastings and um, wellhead protection at large. So um, just a little aside, when I was an undergrad at UNL, um, I completely lamented the fact that I was studying geology in a state where there are essentially no rocks. <laughs> so, you know, if you wanted to see rocks, um, you have to find them in riverbeds, in railroad cuts. Um, you know, you might have some surviving rocks out at like chimney rock, you know, that's barely hanging on surviving erosion. But, you know, I always thought, gosh, you know, for geologists, this place is boring. Um, but upon my return and working in groundwater, you know, I'm really learning that Nebraska's geology story is a really fascinating and really complicated kind of hidden one. Um, and I think that for folks to understand their water resources a little bit better, I think that it helps to kind of have a backstory on how Nebraska water came to be, where it is. Um, so to do that, I want to go back in history um, a few million years. So um, in order to talk about water quality in our state, we really have to talk about how that water came to be. And in order to talk about that, we have to go back to the sediments that make up um, our subsurface. So back millions of years ago to the Cretaceous period. And there is a really amazing collection of paleogeographic maps published by a geologist who studies the Colorado Plateau, um, where he basically goes in and reconstructs what the earth looked like at different uh, periods in time based on the geologic record. Um, so this map is from the Cretaceous period about 75 million years ago. Um, and during this time, there was a lot of volcanic activity happening at the mid oceanic rifts. So continents were being built. 
um, and magma was coming up, you know, from the subsurface, and so it was displacing ocean water, and this ocean water had nowhere to go. Um, so at this time, almost every major land mass across the globe had an intercontinental sea across it. And so this image is what the intercontinental sea looked like um, across what is now North America. And I traced out a scratchy little line of our state of Nebraska in red here to show, you know, where we kind of fit in that global picture. And you'll notice, you know, we were almost completely underwater 75 million years ago. So um, different, envi different environments create different sediments um, to be deposited during that time. And so for a shallow sea, sandstones are going to be what's left behind after that sea recedes. So that's part of our geologic story in Nebraska. Um, and then even more recently, after those seas receded, um, we entered an ice age. So Nebraska has actually experienced several um, periods of glaciation. And when glaciers, just a little bit of history about glaciers, um, when glaciers advance, they rip up rocks from the land all around and beneath them. And they act just kind of like a huge conveyor belt. So they just jumble everything up in a mismatched, mismatched order. And then once they start to retreat, they just dump it all out. So um, many of you probably have heard of glacial till. That's the name of the deposit from glaciers. Um, and it's just completely a hodgepodge. So that's kind of the story for the eastern half of the state um, in the subsurface. So, um, in addition to that, I guess to complicate things even more, can you all see my cursor? Or is it hidden? Oh, okay, you can. Yeah. Okay, so to complicate things even more, you know, you could have rivers. So this is the ex. Oh, we lost. Okay. We lost your sound. Yeah. Our screen froze for me. Yeah, it might help if we all put our um, stop our videos. Just. Oh, is it is the connection not that great? I don't know. It's you're popping in and out. You're good now. So I think okay. that. Okay, sounds good. Um, so this green line is the extent of the most recent um, ice sheet and glaciation in Nebraska. So just a little geologic history for you. Um, so are you seeing... Are you seeing my slot? I'm sorry, I want to make sure you're seeing the right thing. Are you seeing the, pre the whole presentation? Or are you seeing my slide with the next slide and then the notes? No, we're just seeing your main, the slide that you're working off of currently. Oh, okay, great. Um, all right, so groundwater resources in Nebraska. So this is a map of the High Plains Aquifer System down the middle here, as many of you probably recognize. It spans across eight different states. And um, the varying colors denote the varying saturated thickness of the aquifer system. And as you'll notice, we are sitting over the you know, bulk of it. So um, that said, we have a major responsibility in the state of Nebraska to be managing this resource um, in the most appropriate way. So what are we using our water for in Nebraska? Um, similar to what the water profile looks like across the rest of the globe, we are ultimately using our water for irrigation here to grow crops, right? Um, the map on the right shows all of the registered wells in the state with a table below that calls out uh, the different type of wells. And as you can see from the density map and the pie chart, um, irrigation in our state is the number one use of wells and then followed by domestic and then livestock wells. So, you know, just looking at the density across the state, you might be able to pick out some familiar areas, some familiar um, river channels. So the, here's another um, 
irrigation well density. So this is just the irrigation wells, not all of the different wells that are being used. And you know you can see very clearly how the density of the irrigation wells follows the Platte River Valley, and then also up here. Or any contaminants really. Um, but namely nitrate is what we're focused on in Nebraska um, to our drinking water. And you can see the faint outline of the High Plains aquifer system right here, as you probably recognize. And you can probably even recognize just in our state, again, that Platte River Valley and then the Elkhorn Valley up here. And this is a map of vulnerability. So how susceptible are all of these places across the country to contamination in their drinking water? So what exactly does vulnerability mean? Um, so there are two major factors to consider when we think about how susceptible our groundwater is um, to potential contamination. And the first one is how deep is our water table? What's the depth to water? And then the second one is how permeable are our soils? So how easily does water move through the soil? So these red and yellow areas across the state are areas that we have um, well-drained soil, so things move through them very quickly, and also shallow depth to groundwater, so our water table is quite close to the surface. Um, and again, I mean, you're probably going to get sick of seeing the same pattern over and over again, um, but you'll notice a lot of recurring themes throughout. Um, so this is just a quick map of our depth to groundwater across the state. Um, zero to 50 feet is the light blue, and notice this is so it's the most shallow in our riverbed here on the plat, um, and then in these drainages. So um, this map shows great concentrations across the state by township, and this is a map that we create um, in the groundwater department at DEE. Um, every year for the for our report to the legislature. So this is what we send to the legislature to try to help inform decisions about what kinds of actions we can be taking, um, especially in these high priority areas like the Platte River Basin or the Bazil area up here near the Elkhorn River. And these are the concentrations of nitrate. And so um, 10 uh, milligrams per liter is what the EPA uh, maximum contaminant level is for public health um, advisory. And so you'll notice a lot of places in our state along these vulnerable areas are well above that limit. And that is the limit that EPA has deemed, you know, at which we are starting to see health, um, health ramifications. And I know Marty will talk a lot more about that. Um, so this is a graph of the rising trend of nitrate across our state. And Nebraska is really lucky because we've been taking groundwater samples for decades longer than a lot of other states have. So we have data going back to the mid 1970s, um, you know, with the establishment of our NRDs, we've been really lucky because we have all of this water quality data and we can see um, what's happening in our groundwater systems. Um, but there are caveats to the sampling. So, um, you know, wells could be screened in different aquifers, different, so we're talking different depths in the subsurface. Um, some aquifers are connected to others and others are not. So, you know, you could be sampling something, um, you know, you could, a lot of irrigation wells are quite deep. And so you could be sampling an irrigation well that's, um, deep and maybe you're not seeing any signs of nitrate in that, but maybe a public water system well um, is showing nitrate levels and it's only like a half a mile away or something like that. So that's something that a lot of times when we talk about um, nitrate levels, you know, and understandably so folks are asking, well, you know, if I have, if I have nitrates in my water, why doesn't my neighbor that's only, you know, two miles down the road have anything? And there's just a lot of uh, differences between where people's wells could be screened, you know, what the what's going on in the subsurface. If you think about um, just the difference between the glacial 
deposits and you know the ocean deposits and just the spread that is across Nebraska. Um, we have some very complex geology. So I mean, I know that's a kind of a lame answer for folks, just you know, to say, well, it's really complicated um, in the subsurface, but ultimately, you know, if you want to know exactly what is going on in the subsurface, that requires a lot of data to be collected and um, the will for that research to be done. So um, here's just a, another couple maps of the nitrate concentrations. Um, the one on the right is from 2018 only, and you'll see the same themes again. And this is from the agrochemical database for groundwater, which is um, what we call the clearinghouse. It's kind of the hub for all of our data that the NRDs collect, that USGS collects. Um, so what can we do? I feel like I spent a lot of time on the doom and gloom part of the, <laughs> this issue, but um, do not despair because there is hope. There are a lot of things that we can be doing and there are a lot of things that folks are already doing. Um, so one thing to know is the only way that we can remove nitrate from our drinking water is through treatment. So, you know, it's not something that we can just issue a boiling um, advisory and if you boil your water, it goes away, right? So we, the only ways that we can do this are treatment and that's looking at installing a reverse osmosis or um, ion exchange or, you know, plugging into a new, uh, a different public water system, maybe piping into another public water system, um, drilling a new well, maybe trying to look for water in a, in an isolated aquifer that's not connected. Um, and as you can imagine, none of these things are cheap. So that's kind of where the well head protection program comes in. Um, so in 1998, Nebraska passed LB 1161, authorizing the Wellhead Protection Act. And what the Wellhead Protection Program does is it sets up a process for public water supply systems to use if they want to implement a wellhead protection plan. Um, so it's a completely voluntary program. Every, well, it's a voluntary program, but however, every public water system across the state um, is required to have at least a map showing their source water area. So this is an example of Waverly. I know that Marty has an example of Hastings um, Wellhead Protection Area in his talk. So this is the boundary and this boundary is created based on um, where potential contaminants could um, impact your drinking well based on the local geology. So these time of travel paths, um, the different colors denote the different amount of times that it will take a hypothetical contaminant to enter your public water system well. So the purple tails way out here are 50 years. So if you have a contaminant that enters out here, um, theoretically it'll take 50 years to get to your public water system. So we try to take the best available geologic data um, and create these boundaries so that communities can make decisions or even ordinances or overlay zones to protect their source water. So one major way that we can fund these plans is through um, source water protection grants. So every year um, we offer source water protection grants um, totaling up to about $150,000 to communities with fewer than 10,000 people and that can show financial hardship. And in the state of Nebraska, I mean, that's every rural community. Um, so political subdivisions that manage a public water system are eligible. So this could be um, a rural water, even a rural water system or an NRD that operates a water system. Um, and they are required to put in 10% match and then the, um, we cover the rest. And things that could go into a grant like this include public education. That's actually um, a big part of it is, is information and outreach um, so communities are required to put on um, open houses, sometimes workshops, sometimes um, they'll do a workshop that could be um, for producers in the area. So uh, looking at how to implement best management practices, things like cover crops, um, things that will protect the drinking water. Um, we can help fund closure of abandoned wells. So if there are wells that are, are 
you know, I don't like to word, use the word illegal, but, um, you know, wells that are abandoned that are not properly cased, we can go and make sure that we are um, properly abandoning those. And um, we can do even, even provide cost share for certain best management practices. So the process is in a really exciting place right now because I'm working really closely with the folks in Re Region 7 EPA to develop something called a drinking water protection management plan. And so the thing with the drinking water protection management plan is it just gives um, some teeth into what we can be doing on the ground. So a well hair protection plan while it is useful, it's more of a snapshot of a community's public water system. So, you know, somebody, maybe a new council member could come in and understand what's going on as far as the public water system goes, you know, where are the contaminants, where are the potential contaminants, you know, um, where are the wells, that kind of stuff. But there's no real, um, you know, there's no real element of getting on the ground practices through a wellhead protection plan. So this drinking water protection management plan um, fulfills, once it's approved by EPA, it fulfills the criteria for a 319 watershed plan. And I know, sorry, this might be just a lot of jargon, but ultimately it opens the door for a lot more funding for projects in the end. So through the 319 program, a community could come in for up to, upwards of $300,000 to implement best management practices versus, you know, my kind of small potatoes source water grants, which, you know, for each community could be 30 to $60,000. So there's just a lot more funding for communities who are gung ho about, um, you know, making these changes in their, in their community. <clears throat> so here are the areas that we have these plans already on um, Broken Bow, Fairbury, Springfield, Syracuse, Tacoma, and Waverly. Um, so it's very new. The first plan was, I want to say it was in 2016 or 17. So, you know, we're learning as we go with EPA, trying to identify, okay, how can we measure progress? Because this is a legacy issue. And as many of you know, you know, it's hard to understand, okay, is the nitrate that we're dealing with in the subsurface right now, is that from the last five years, from the last 10 years? Is it from the last, you know, 50 years? These are all possibilities depending on the complexity of the subsurface. So, you know, when you're planning for long-term goals like this, um, it's very challenging to try to get metrics that will show what is the progress. So, you know, maybe, maybe you're not going to see progress um, in 10 years. And by progress, maybe I'm, I'm saying, you know, we want to see Hastings nitrate levels down by, you know, under that 10, 10 MCL, or, you know, maybe we want to see it under three or something like that. So um, it's been an evolving process and EPA has been really, really accommodating. And we've been having a lot of great conversations around um, how to tackle this. But the exciting thing is that um, right now we have a plan that's for Springfield that once approved, we are planning on building a template for so that any, um, any community across the nation, so I work on a source water collaborative that's nationwide and a lot of other states have expressed interest in kind of following our lead on how to address groundwater issues um, through the non-point source pollution management, because a lot of times this is a surface water issue, but since we are such a groundwater heavy state, we're kind of an anomaly, but there are other states that also rely on groundwater who are super interested. So this is a really exciting thing for Nebraska because um, no other state is, is doing this yet. So um, here's an example of York's uh, source water grant. They were actually implementing growing rotational crops on their wellhead. Um, on their well field. And this is just kind of showing they're actually making money from it. So it's, it's not something that really we just have to, um, you know, fund and just have it be a one and done thing. You know, if we implement, implement these long term changes, um, the return on investment could be really great for communities. Um, and then the 2018 Farm Bill, um, this is just kind of an overview of what we're doing statewide. So we are working with NRCS 
really closely um, in a subgroup of the state technical committee um, addressing source water protection. And actually NRCS has launched a source water um, protection initiative that um, would essentially they're able to divert 10% of all NRCS conservation funds towards source water protection. So that's a big sum of money, two and a half million dollars in the state of Nebraska that we can be putting into source water protection. So a lot of new exciting things have been happening in the past few years for source water protection. So this is the priority map um, that NRCS, that we developed with NRCS of the priority areas. So as you'll notice um, here in the Platte River Valley, we have these groundwater management areas that have higher nitrates that we're trying to target. Um, the red here are all the well head protection areas. Those are really the highest priority areas um, for this funding, so. Okay, so just to kind of wrap things up. So um, overarching themes here and goals are that, you know, we have all these plan planning. Sometimes I think gets a bad rep because it just seems like this, you know, bureaucratic government slow term thing that it takes forever. And it does, it does take a long time, but, you know, ultimately, it's focusing on the long term gains, right? So we have to be thinking, how many generations in the future are we willing to think? And I think that's the real challenge. You know, are you thinking about your kids? Are you thinking about your grandkids? Are you thinking about, you know, 50 years, you know, 100 years in the future, we really have, this is a marathon. It's, it's definitely not a sprint. So while that can be really overwhelming, um, you know, ultimately planning is a huge part of that. But, you know, we have to make the shift from having this reactionary, um, you know, to, from being reactionary to being proactive. And so ultimately, what is our huge goal. So our huge goal in the simplest terms is to be putting less nitrogen on the ground, right? Because that is ultimately what the issue is that we're trying to address here. But, you know, there's so many stakeholders and there's so many in and outs um, when it comes to how people are affected, you know, getting the science out there, getting the actual information of how things are moving through the subsurface, what's effective, what's not. Um, and Marty's going to talk a lot more about all of those different aspects. So I think this might be my last. Yep. So moving forward. So every year we have source water grants. Um, we're constantly updating well health protection maps um, with the newest modeling technology. And uh, Nebraska has launched a statewide initiative of which uh, Marty and I are both a part of where we are bringing stakeholders together to try to really hash through um, who needs to be at the table? How can we make the best decisions um, with all voices being heard? And so it's it's a very exciting thing that folks have been working on for decades, um, you know, not notably, but uh, I'm really happy to be a part of it. So education, as Marty and I had a really long conversation this morning, you know, before the meeting, education is, is key. And how do we get these messages out to folks um, in a way that is, you know, smart and we're using proper risk communication. We're not just going into a community and saying, okay, all these bad things are happening. And then, you know, leaving without a plan. That's not, that's not our goal. So, um, I, I know we're not open. I know Marty um, will agree with me on this too. I wanna open after Marty's done with his presentation, I wanna open it up to discussion and hear um, what everyone's thoughts are and inputs, so. That is it for my spiel, and I will turn it over to Marty and stop sharing my screen. Can you see my screen now? Yep. And it's just a single pane? Yeah, it's just a single. So uh, I, I do appreciate being asked to, to do this because, uh, you know, that's one of the things that, uh, uh, as um, Tatiana mentioned, that we need to get education out there. And, and I, I look at all of these opportunities to visit with people are kind of like Pepsi moments. 
uh, we need to make sure that we can talk to people, and sometimes it's, it's good to just meet with smaller groups and trying to get, you know, some kind of press release out or whatever. So I uh, appreciate you helping me with, the, you know, the work that I'm trying to get done. So um, I'm going to do uh, really three things here to, to this afternoon. Uh, I want to just briefly define the problem. Um, I know most of you are aware of this, but just kind of a reiteration of that. I want to discuss a little bit about those elements that are in the wellhead protection plan that Tatiana talked about, and then really get to the um, kind of the meat of what I want to talk about, and that is how do we implement those, and really how do we go about paying for those uh, those plans uh, or, or those um, uh, actions that we want to take. So, uh, just starting out here, um, you know. As most of you probably know, we're dealing with nitrates and uranium, but there's also this issue of gross alpha, selenium, there's pH, there's changes in hardness, other inorganic levels out there. We're seeing detection limits of very low levels of atrazine. Uh, ultimately, what's been happening is we've been taking wells offline, and uh, of course, the uh, utilities and cities have been uh, very proactive in trying to get uh, you know more wells built, uh, come up with a a response to the, to to that, and of course we built some um, uh, the uh, aquifer storage and restoration project, and and that's ongoing. But I want to talk just a little bit about the uranium investigation, and this is usually something that you just don't hear a lot about, but it's really part of the whole nitrate issue. Uh, we worked with the university um, and some of the folks there. They did some work in Hastings and Alda, and they were able to tie this release of uranium. Uh, we, we became aware of it when the city of Grand Island was dealing with uranium and the health department was tell, you know, saying uh, people were getting nitrates, but then all of a sudden they're getting hit by uranium, you know, really what was kind of going on. We noticed that, that our gross alpha was going up and also that our uranium was starting to go up as well. What they have found is that there are nitrates that are obviously in the aquifer. Uh, they're traveling through the beta zone, you know, coming from the root zone, you know, being applied by the fertilizer. And, and those nitrates are actually promoting microbiological growth. And with that, that growth, some of the bacteria, certain kinds of bacteria, actually are releasing uranium that's naturally found on the sands and gravels that we have out there. So the uranium is out there, essentially occurring, but if it's always stuck to the gravel, you just didn't worry about it. But in this case, because of increased microbial uh, respiration, that uranium is now being released. Uh, not only is it uranium, uh, but we're also seeing an increase in selenium and chromium coming through. So it's really a, 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 a lot of those metals are starting to be released. Uh, we'll just make a point that arsenic doesn't behave the same way, but right now we're tracking uh, selenium as the one thing that we're seeing quite a bit of. Chrome, not so much. So uh, we can actually see a real correlation between selenium and uranium right now in our municipal wells. So what's a, what's a water system to do when you have those kinds of issues that you need to do? So, you know, the first thing is you've got to identify uh, your uh, um, um, wellhead protection area, define the problem. So based upon those initial uh, investigations that we've done, understanding what was coming into our wells, uh, Hastings decided to implement a wellhead protection plan. So what's all involved in that wellhead protection plan? Basically, wellhead protection means protecting the area surrounding public drinking water supply wells and in turn protecting the water supply. So it's not just the physical part of the well, but it's also where that water is coming from. And as Tantiana uh, mentioned, you, know, you do modeling, you would show a delineation of where that water comes from. I'm not sure how clear this picture came out, but these red lines that are in here, that's the, the path that water takes. Um, I can just tell you that about right here is the Genia feed yard uh, processors up in this area. This is a 20 year travel time. Uh, it's about 50 year travel time between here and the Platte River. So we've done actually modeling. Uh, we've actually had uh, a couple of uh, different times where we've gotten consultants in and they've actually uh, developed some pretty sophisticated models to show where that water is coming from. So we feel pretty comfortable with that data. Part of the wellhead protection plan is also to identify sources of contamination. You know, obviously we thought about feedlots and uh, you know agriculture runoff, but you also got to take into account things like the railroads running through here. There's major highways in here. There could be spills, those kinds of things. Are there chemical storage? 
Uh, it could be something as, as simple as, um, you know, fuel tanks, uh, you know, farmer may have out, out in his field, but uh, because uh, there's an irrigation well nearby, um, you know, could, could uh, gasoline or diesel get into the aquifer uh, fairly quickly. So we looked at all of those, those parts of it and identified the, the potential of contamination in our well protection area. Part of the well protection plan is come up with a contingency plan. Uh, what are you going to do if something goes wrong with your aquifer? You know, what, what are your plans to do that? Uh, we looked at both a short-term and a long-term um, issues um, uh, related to loss of drinking water. Uh, and that, that plan was put together with the help of the public. We did include uh, uh, different committees. We had a well protection committee put together, and ultimately we ended up with a, an executive water committee uh, that kind of fine-tuned the plan, we worked with the NRDs, uh, worked with uh, uh, county extension. It was a lot of uh, people that, that brought some information to that. I point out the, um, the logo here, that's the logo we came up with because what we realize is that everybody has a stake in groundwater. It's not just a city problem. Um, certainly areas well outside the city of Hastings is impacting the, the Hastings municipal water system. We recognized and with well protection plans, public education is key. Um, I remember one of our NRD uh, uh, staff had said that, that a well protection plan is 90% public education, 10% doing something. And, you know, I think he was probably right. It just takes a lot of public education out there. And I'm glad to see, you know, folks like Tatiana helping us with some of that public education and the outreach that we need to make. So I talked about kind of the short-term and long-term action plans. Um, but what it was determined was that there was no way that there could be a short-term uh, remedy uh, for the aquifer that could protect the uh, water system in Hastings uh, short of Hastings um, doing water treatment. Uh, we did do an initial plan of uh, just treating the water and it came up to about $72.6 million. Uh, our board said, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, come up with a better plan. And we came up with what we call the Aquifer Storage and Restoration Project. Uh, got that capital improvement down about $46 million. Uh, happy to say we have not spent only about a third of that right now. And right now we're kind of in a monitoring mode. So you know, that thing is working out really well. Um, the wellhead protection plan then looked at a long-term action plan. And from that, we developed the Hastings Wellhead Protection Groundwater Management Area Action Plan, and that included the City of Hastings, Hastings Utilities, the Little Blue, and the Upper Big Blue. So there was a three-way agreement uh, that came together to implement best management practice. Um, it does address both nitrogen-based fertilizers and irrigation use. What we determined was that irrigation is a vital part of this. If they're overwatering, they're actually allowing the nitrates to move past the red zone, so then the farmers want to put on more fertilizer because that becomes a limiting part of it. So those two things really have to go hand in hand. And I, I like to say they're kind of the two sides of the same coin, so th th we understand that. The, the good news in all of this is that the upper big blue and the little blue, they started with this plan. Uh, it was just for the Hastings area, and um, since that time, since 2012, uh, they have adopted those. Uh, I know the little blue has adopted it for the entire uh, NRD that's out there. So they, they, this became a template or a, kind of a stepping stone to include that. Uh, since that time, uh, we also got water meters on all the irrigation wells out there so the farmers know how much they're putting on. Certainly that was a struggle to, to, to make that happen, but at least now they, they can at least monitor the amount of water that they're putting on in addition to the amount of nitrates that they're putting on. So getting to kind of my, my third part of, uh, of the discussion here, and I think so sort of kind of the meat of it, is that we do these things um, and we're getting pretty good at developing well protection plans. Um, there's monies, uh, like Titiana mentioned, that uh, can help communities do this. Uh, we were fortunate that we 
you know, I had some, you know, some expertise uh, that we could call upon, you know, as far as getting some modeling and those kinds of things done. Some communities, that's, that's a little tough for them to do. They just don't have the, the, the uh, population base to, to hire consultants, that, that kind of thing. But what, what we noticed is that the, the, the next real big problem is, yeah, you can have a great plan, but if you can't implement it and you can't fund it, that's, that, you know, it just kind of dies at that point. So I think all of us in Nebraska – because this isn't just a Hastings problem, you know. We're really facing. Okay, you've got a wild protection plan, but what does that really mean? And how do we how do we get it implemented? How do we get all the stakeholders that are involved uh, to really buy into this plan? So, just want to point out something, kind of set the stage for this. That since 1990 through 2015, there were, we did some work in there. But there was actually a 68 percent increase in nitrates in the Hastings area. And you can see the city of Hastings here, and you can see there's a lot of nitrates that are coming off that Platte River out there. Uh, and this correlates well with a couple of the slides that Tatiana had. It shows a you know, significant increase in nitrates that are um, you know, being found in the, in the aquifer. I do want to point out here that, that this isn't because the Platte River is bringing it in. It's because these are very shallow soils here. There's a lot of nitrates that are getting in the aquifer very quickly. It's just a time of travel issue. Actually, the Platte River doesn't have a lot of nitrates in it just because the biological activity actually converts nitrates to nitrogen gas. But what we're seeing here is this is now flowing towards the city of Hastings. Groundwater flows from the northwest to the southeast. Uh, as Tatiana said, there's kind of a recurring theme here, and uh, uh, this matches up really well. This is, the blue in here is actually nitrate levels. And then here is a uranium map. And you can see that it follows pretty much that. There are some areas where uh, uranium is naturally occurring. But if you look at this blue area here in the Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas area, it's very similar to the blue area that's occurring in California. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that uh, the increase in uranium in these areas is really due to nitrates uh, coming into the, to the beta zone and into the aquifer um, causing that microbial uh, um, action to release the or at least to mobilize those, the uranium. So I want to talk a little bit about what are the water quality effects on health and crop. And I, 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 I brought out this uh, picture or this icon, Imagine Hastings. And one of the things we kind of may forget about, we talk about our, our water quality and health in the public, but you also got the health of the community. Uh, you know, if we're a community, community that's known of have, to have high water rates, uh, it's hard to bring industry in. It's also, uh, you know, it looks bad, you know, and people will say, oh, you need to treat the water, those kinds of things. So, you know, having good clean water, having a, a good a handle on the management of the aquifer, it, it's not just only good for your water rates, but it's good for the entire city of Hastings, and it's good for the community, it's good for Adams County, it's good for the state. So. Um, it really, it's, it's not just the health of the people, but it's also the ec economic health that's out there. But when we look at uranium, obviously it's the issue of blue baby syndrome, and with uranium, it's a, it's a cancer issue. So I'll talk about that just a little bit here. So the blue baby syndrome, and I know I'm talking to the experts here on that, and I'm not going to pronounce it because I butcher it every time, but uh, it is just basically a lack of oxygen. The babies do turn blue. It's just because the nitrates uh, interfere in the, in the uh, transmission of oxygen uh, in the blood. But I did pull this out as well, and there's a lot of new work that's being done, and I thought this was really a kind of a bold statement here. Uh, this comes from the University of Minnesota. Um, they, they, they talk about that the research is examined data from across the United States and found a correlation between certain types of cancer and nitrate. This is the first time this correlation has been quantified. We're seeing more and more of these kinds of studies out there. We're seeing that, that nitrates, or at least areas that have high nitrates, or is an increase in cancer. Uh, now, whether that's directly related to nitrates, or is it other things that are out there, is there other chemical, uh, you know, agricultural chemicals, uh, but there's a lot of work that's being done on that. Uh, we, we in the water industry really expect that uh, we'll move from the blue baby syndrome of 10 milligrams per liter is the limit to something that's probably going to be based upon a cancer risk that's out there, it, which means that it could be lower in these nitrate levels, and it's going to be or acceptable levels for nitrates in our drinking water, which means that there could be a lot more expense that communities are going to have to uh, uh, bear. 
I brought this one in because it's a little closer to home. Um, the University of Nebraska is working on some uh, uh, data uh, that they're they, that they're um, trying to uh, um, um, analyze, and they're looking at uh, nitrates and uh, other agricultural chemicals that that are out there. And the thing I I caught out of this was if you look here, some of the highest levels of of birth defects is actually occurring in the Adams and Webster counties. And for us, that, that, that's a concern. Um, certainly don't want to see that. That, that makes it, uh, again, tough to you know, want to get people to come to uh, central Nebraska, that kind of thing. Uh, so those all have an impact on the health of our community, health of our people, health of our agricultural production. Um, just maybe briefly about uranium, and I'm sure I'll get uh, you know some correction here. But what I try to tell people is that uranium kind of mimics the calcium that's stored in your body. So uranium can get stored in different parts of your body. It can cause uh, you know cancer, you know, as well as liver, kidney, and bone diseases that are out there. It's uh, obviously you just don't need that radioactive uh, element in your body. And here's something that you don't really hear a lot about. But uranium uh, impacts crop production as well. Uh, as I said before, uranium mimics calcium. It, 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 as uranium that's found in the water, the irrigation water that we're pulling out of the ground, um, then there's an opportunity for that uranium to impact the plants. It impacts the root system and actually can uh, cause problems with uh, plant growth. Um, the uranium that we find in the soil actually reduces crop yields. Uh, up there, and you can see the amount of calcium um, that's um, found in uh, normal corn. It's pretty high. So when you start, um, you know, looking at the idea of uranium and calcium, uh, there's a great potential that a lot of uranium could be pulled up by our agricultural uh, production and stored uh, as a replacement of the calcium that's there. So the economic burden. So how much is it going to cost to remove our, our nitrates? We talked about the $46 million for the city of Hastings, and those are going to be, you know, proportionally similar numbers for a lot of communities uh, in, in Nebraska. So um, the, the $46 million um, that, that we proposed out there, like I said, we're about a third of that right now, but our operating costs right now are running about a million dollars per year, uh, and that was to be expected. Uh, if we go into uh, uranium removal, um, I would expect those to go up. They, they might even double uh, in time, but that could be another $20 million that we need to spend. So, but to put that, that $46 million in perspective, we've got about 10,000 service connections out there, and that, that, that means that we've add, if we spend the $46 million, we would add $4,600 worth of capital improvement to each service connection. So it's like just having a mortgage that you have to pay plus $100 per year um, for each water customer that's out there. Um, every time we try to raise water rates, we talk about a few dollars a month. So to try to get to $100 a, uh, a year, I mean, we're looking at close to $10 a, a, a month uh, to really to cover that. And we haven't really addressed other issues in the system like aging water mains, removing lead services, those kinds of things. So it's a concern that we have is how we're going to finance this. So I ask these questions and I don't have answers. And uh, I think you know part of our discussion and Tatiana and I want to visit is you know if there's some ideas we'd like to hear those. Uh, but who should pay for safe drinking water? Uh, should the polluter pay? And and I like to think about what happens when a um, um, uh, co-op brings fuel out to a farmer's uh, uh, home and he's filling the fuel tanks and the hose breaks and spills on the ground. Uh, I'm sure that farmer says, co-op, you got to pick this up and clean it up because you contaminated my well and you got to fix it. But yet on the other side of nitrates, we put nitrates out there and yet the polluter isn't really necessarily paying in this case. So, so the use of nitrates by agriculture means that the farmers still make a profit and currently they're still putting on at least 10% excess in the fields based upon what we've been seeing with the uh, beta zone sampling and so forth. That has not changed. Um, it's really a, a, a practice that they have. Uh, but they're, they're the ones making the profit, so should the polluter pay um, in there? Um, 
Next uh, thought was, should the NRD pay? Uh, they basically have a jurisdiction and obligation to protect the groundwater. Uh, I will say that the NRD uh, board have been slow to enact rules. Uh, they don't want to add anything to, you know, impede the, the farmers from producing their crop, uh, you know, as far as taxes, as far as regulations, and so forth. Um, they had not effectively monitored the groundwater. We found that in our sampling that they were uh, taking um, um, water samples from people who wanted to give water samples to the NRD, and what we found was that those people were giving that water samples up uh, because they had good, clean water. But the people that knew that they had bad water, they weren't bringing them into the NRD, so their database was really biased. Uh, we certainly changed that with our sampling that we did. Um, I will note that the NRDs, uh, along with the uh, um, uh, NET grants that we get, uh, have been very supportive in studies and plannings. Uh, but we're talking about, you know, lots of dollars well past that planning process. Question that came up is, should the city pay? They're the ones that need the potable water, uh, but they're, and they're currently, we're financing all that short-term action, but it's the long-term uh, issues of getting the farmers to maybe do better because a million dollars a year just keeps on rolling, uh, and it's only going to get more expensive as time goes on. Do, you know, is, is it really a responsibility of the uh, water consumer to have to pay for that treatment even though they didn't cause it? Or at least be a uh, significant contributor to it? The question I ask is, should the federal government pay? Um, as they have implemented cheap food policies to try and feed the world, uh, this has caused an increase in demand for I increased yields. Um, when we have those cheap food policies, we've kept that price of grain down. These farmers, the only way to increase their uh, monetary gain is to actually increase their yields. So by doing that, they've had to put more fertilizer on, put more water on. Uh, really, our federal government, uh, through some of its policies and so forth, have you know really incentivized farmers to uh, you know get as get as much out of the that crop as they can, and to do that, we've in, in a way uh, have contributed to the groundwater contamination. Um, ultimately, that cheap food policy is. Um, uh, a benefit to those countries that we sell that, that, that grain to. Uh, if we sell them cheap grain, they're in essence uh, taking advantage of the environmental damage that we have here in Nebraska by, the, by that production of crop. Uh, obviously, we're not collecting money from them. They're, they're getting the benefit of the cheap food, but yet we're, we're paying the, uh, the, the price here. And I know that there's lots of social and political impacts to it, but I just want to point out that there's a lot of different players that are in this. Um, and one of the things that, that has occurred in the recent uh, years here is this, this need for more alcohol uh, for uh, automotive fuel. Um, we've had uh, cheap corn prices out there, cheap soybean prices. So one of the ways to uh, boost those prices was to try to increase the demand for um, corn and soybeans here in Nebraska uh, by making alcohol. But by doing that, um, they've also uh, increased that production, which then has somewhat suppressed the, the, uh, the um, uh, cost for, or the, the, the cost paid for the, the corn as well, which is kind of a, a trade-off uh, of trying to get more demand out there. But it's also then taken all that food, or that uh, uh, distillers grain, provided as, as feedstock for livestock, and now we've got concentrated um, areas where uh, feeding, livestock feeding is occurring, which then can contribute to uh, sources of nitrates as well. So there's a kind of a feedback or consequences of trying to increase the demand for uh, grain uh, to produce alcohol. And again, we're producing alcohol and we're really not feeding the world. So uh, it's really a conversion of, of, of food into energy. So again, who pays for the safe drinking water? One of the things that I look uh, that that I'm trying to get a, a handle on here was that as we increase that production, that may be a a, a benefit, but unfortunately to the farmer, but unfortunately it's a short-term benefit because as they try to increase their income, it ultimately ends up with an even larger surplus because everybody tries to get into it, and so then there's more more grants being uh, produced, and then we got to find ways to get rid of that. Uh, so should the government pay farmers to not produce? But is this really agricultural welfare? Um, 
not sure that that's an answer either. Uh, I don't know that uh, farmers don't want to, uh, I don't think farmers want to get paid not to do anything. They really want to be producing. They want, they, they want to feed the world. But in a sense, is that really the, the right thing to do? Um, should the fertilizer companies pay? They're, they're making profit in this as well. Um, they sometimes are in a position where they recommend fertilizer applications that are out there. Uh, I see it as kind of a problem with a fox watching the hen house. Um, how do you know that they're making uh, decisions that are best for the environment, best for the groundwater, and not necessarily best for their uh, uh, bottom line? This cheap food policy isn't just for folks outside the United States or outside the state of Nebraska, it's also right here. I mean, we benefit from having uh, fairly uh, uh, cheap food prices. And, and granted, we don't make a lot of food that we eat here, but it's all part of the whole cheap food uh, price uh, policies that we have. So should the consumer pay? They're, 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 they're getting some benefit out of that. Then I, I bring up, which is probably a, a, a close to the answer is, but should this be a combination of responsible parties? Um, should we be bringing these different stakeholders in there? Um, you know, one of the, the thoughts I had here, I, I had an opportunity to interview a banker um, to talk about these kinds of, of issues, and I said, you know, in a sense, if the farmer puts on excess fertilizer, you're actually gaining, and that's because they're having to get more monies for their operating loan, which means that they pay more interest. So from a, a banker standpoint, if he got all of his, uh, you know, uh, customers out there uh, that he's loaning money to, to do a better job of, of putting nitrates on, uh, he'd actually probably see less money that he needs to loan out. So, you know, where does he stand in, in the mix of things as well? Though I don't think any any banker is recommending they go waste it, but, but it's all part of, of the interaction between uh, food production and the uh, the issues of nitrates that we're dealing with. So, another problem that I see here in trying to get wellhead protection uh, issues or plans, regulations, whatever uh, implemented is just this competing demand for resources. Uh, you know, I, I throw this up. Um, you know, the you know everybody has these competing. Uh, concerns, you know, where, where should I put my efforts at? You know, COVID-19, I put that on there, obviously we're doing that, but it's cancer, it's, you know, how do we help, uh, you know, our community to reunite way, domestic violence, all those things. You know, how, how do we get people to, you know, say, hey, this is important when there's all these other things that are just as important as well? You know, getting the public and responsibilities to find a solution, I think, is going to be a, a tough challenge. We don't have any answers. Um, folks like Tatiana, I, you know, I, I like to see her energy and so forth out there. Uh, we've got good people that are working on it, but we're going to need a lot of help on it. This is this, the, it, was, it, it was easy getting a uh, wellhead protection plan, but it's a lot harder to get it to be adopted and to create uh, really change in our, our in our. Uh, um, area with the farmers and, and our use of nitrates. Um, you know, how do you get this message out with, see, without seeming like you're crying wolf? Uh, you know, I have a lot of people just say, oh, you're always talking about nitrates. Well, yeah, it's there, but, you know, i I, I got to keep talking about it because if I don't, who is, right? Um, you know, how, how do we get the factual information out there? I, this this is a, a, a problem I see here is that we've got people that, um, you know, think that they know a lot about what's happening in their aquifer, um, and I'm just going to give this example. I, I had several farmers tell me that I put a foot of water on for my crop, but my wells went down three feet. How can that be? Well, in their own mind, they think it's just a bucket of water down there, but the aquifer is only a third of it is porous space. If I take a foot of water out, I have to drain three foot of the aquifer. And they just swore up and down, we didn't know what we were talking about. I don't know how you get those people to change. They just believed that we were wrong and that, that because they had that piece of fact, fact that they were believing uh, that anything else that we told them, it, it was uh, not right. This really comes down to a problem. How do you, how do you, uh, you, you address these issues where, um, you know, you've got, 
not only misinformation, but you got multiple parties in there. Uh, we're talking about people's livelihood, those kind of things. You know, it's no one person can fix this. It's, it, it's really going to take a, a whole community, and I hate to use that, but it takes a lot of people to make this happen. So, I, I think one of the, the, the big things that we need to try to address that's systemic to these problems is, you know, how do we get people to realize that there is a need for governmental regulations when one public sector is impacting the health and financial stability of another public sector, especially when that, that public sector, and you know, we'll, we'll just say it's you know, the agriculture rural communities, don't want governmental regulations. You know, without government re regulations, I'm not sure how you would get some things changed. It's really a change in social behavior. Um, I think that it, it's, it, you know, that's an area that we really need to work on. It's not just, uh, you know, understanding how water flows or understanding the geology. It's really going to take, you know, people that understand social behavior and how do you get that message across, how do we get that, that done. Um, I think a little bit of, of the things that we could, um, could think about here is, like, fire departments have always said, you know, stop, drop, and roll. You know, all kids know that now. Um, you know, they, they effectively have gotten some social change taking place. I'm not sure what we can do with groundwater, but, th but those are the kinds of things we need to do. We need to get a social change to take place. And when you really look at social change, it's really a tyranny of small decisions. Every farmer I talk to out there says, yeah, but, you know, what I put on, it's, it, it's insignificant. That's true, but it's, it's everybody's doing it, and all those little pieces add up to too much. It's the straw that breaks the camel's back. Um, but to get that information out to them, get them to understand that they need to do their part, it, it's tough. So uh, as you can see, there's no good answer to these problems. We're looking for help. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to say that we're, you know, we've got it all taken care of. You guys can go, you know, go, you know, you're home now, but uh, at the end of this, you say, oh, you, you know, they got to take care of it. But the issue is we're needing lots of help. And so I would extend a, a kind of a, a, a request that if there's anything that you guys can do to, uh, you know, help us or got some ideas, we want to hear about it. Uh, so to address the environmental and financial issue, it's going to re require a change in society's priorities. Uh, it's going to be tough to do. So with that, I'm I'm done. I'm talking. I'm, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, I guess before we get into questions, Chris, do we need to keep this at a timeline? I wonder. Do we have time for questions? We do. We do. Okay. Thanks for asking, but yeah. Okay. All right. Questions then. <clears throat> Marty, what's the term gross alpha? <laughs> the gross alpha is the, the gross alpha radiation that we're seeing in the water. So it's the, it's the proton coming off, and it's not the uh, gamma radiation, but it's the gross alpha radiation. So that, it's that related to the uranium. Yeah, and what it is, it'll, it'll not just be just uranium, but it could be any of the uh, daughter products from the uranium that's breaking down you will see that uranium uh, giving that gross alpha off. And we, we've seen that out there. So it, it, what it was, it was kind of a, an indicator, litmus test of, of what we could see out there that was starting to take place. Um, my next question is how much does the um, fertilizer we put on domestically in Hastings for our green lawns <coughs> contribute to the nitrite levels, nitrate levels? I'm really glad that you asked that question because we've done the second round of vetosone sampling. We went back to the same 20 sites that we did in 2010 and 11. We did this again in 2016. From 2011 through 2016, the farmers uh, nitrate um, that stored in the vetosone between the red zone and the aquifer increased by uh, 42%. And I might get there on my report, but, but over 40%. The nitrates that are in the beta zone in the Hastings area, the, the town of Hastings, actually decreased by 30%. Oh, we have got it turned around, um, and it's 
turn around pretty quickly. We're pretty pleased with that. I, I have to, to put a shout out to uh, a lot of the, the larger uh, areas like the golf courses and those folks and the lawn care companies have really gotten on board. They've done a lot of this themselves. Uh, once we kind of got into it, we realized they, they realized there was a problem out there and they really started uh, to address it. If you don't know this, they're kind of sneaking in the, uh, the idea that everybody wants green lawns but they're not doing it with nitrates. What they're doing is they're adding a little iron sulfate to their mixes, and it makes the, the grass look darker. And so people think that they're getting a good fertilizer component, and which is, which is good. But they, they understand that having a healthy mix of nutrients is better than having excess nitrogen. Um, another question, is the EPA still pumping water at the, at the Superfund sites? Yes, they are, uh, and they're at various stages and so forth. We're still pumping water for the Well D project. Yeah. And how much does that, can that water be used for anything else? Yeah, it is. And, you know, ultimately the Well D project, we're using it for cooling towers. So, you know, we're trying to do that as well. So we're not pumping extra water that's out there. Uh, in some of those, uh, uh, Cases they're trying to re-inject it, you know, kind of like what we're doing. That's where we kind of got the idea as well. Um, there's not a lot of it that's just going down the creek. However, looking at the Navy Ammunition Depot that's out there, they are using it where they're putting it out on the land and doing it. But if you've ever had a chance to go out there and tour that facility, what they're doing is they're allowing it to go through the entire NAD, and they're using it not only as groundwater recharge, but they're using it as uh, free-flowing water. They've increased the ducks and the deer. I mean, they've really increased the wildlife out there. But what they're trying to do is get the cattle to be able to go to water throughout the winter so that it's, it's ice-free. Uh, it's really a, a neat project they have out there. But they're pumping a lot of water, and it is going down the creek. But, uh, but yeah, here in town, we're working closely with them to try to reuse that water as much as possible. And the water that's going to go for, I think it's cooling, isn't it, the new, the new a uh, complex that's being built where they cut down all the trees. Um, yeah. What's the water for that going to be like? Does that have to be potable water that they're going to use? Well, I mean, they're going to have to have potable water for their staff and that, but I believe that they are going to drill a well, and so that's going to be in the area where it's contaminated. Uh, they're aware of that. I, I haven't uh, talked to them recently, but when the plan was started, they were fully aware of the need uh, to use that contamin, or you know, that that the water that was in their area was contaminated. That didn't seem like that was an issue. They're going to connect to the potable system for their uh, drinking water portion. But they, of it. the that the function of that unit is not going to affect a large uh, volume of uh, domestic city water consumption. No, no, not not if it's just for their domestic purposes. They're actually going to be pulling in, you know, the contamination that's coming from like the the South Landfill, Colorado, or new subsites and so forth that that are coming in that area. So in a way, they're going to help with the cleanup. Um, yeah, we are seeing that water is being pulled into us, but when you look at just the, their well, it's again kind of tearing a small decision. When you look at all the irrigation wells that are out there, there's a lot of water being pumped out, and it's really not industry or municipal. Uh, Tontiana's graphs there re really show we're, we're a small portion of that. Okay, good. Thanks. Hi, Marty. This is Elaine Landwehr, and I was just wondering how much um, do we have to worry about the Magellan Midstream Partners pipeline affecting our water supply, the pipeline that runs down the eastern side of Nebraska? Well, you know, that's always a political thing that's out there, but here's what I tell people. If society says that we're going to move that, that product um, from one place to another, and that's a decision people have to make. But if you're going to move it, you have to transport it in some way. I will tell you that pipeline safety is far better than putting it on rail cars, which are subject to derailments. It's better than putting more trucks on the highway that's got to carry it, uh, in tractor trailers that are out there, and they're burning diesel fuel. Uh, so, you know, when I, when I hear people say, you know, how safe the pipeline is, pipelines are pretty safe. Are they without risk? They have risk. But if someone says, yes, we're going to move this from Canada to Texas, I would tell you, I would rather have it a pipeline than on a rail car or a tractor trailer any day. 
I would rather that they work really hard and in putting in the best pipeline they can because that's where I can manage the risk. And I say manage the risk because you will never be without risk, but there is risk. And you think about when they have these spills, they don't go very far because they, they, they it's thick, it shows up, yeah, there's an area, but it's not like um, – nitrates where it can, you know, go into the aquifer and nobody sees it. Uh, usually they're going to know. And, you know, if there's a value to it, they don't want leaks either. You know, they, they, they want to make sure they, uh, you know, get the product down the road. So I, I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah, I, it did. Try Thank be, you very much. I try to be politically correct. All right. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Actually, I have one and it's, oh, it's going to show my ignorance when you were talking about the need for public education about all this, my mind jumped to the inserts that come with the Hastings Utilities bills. <laughs> and I don't recall if there has been information in that insert um, about this. And of course you couldn't compress it all into that, but anyway, just wondered if that was a source for education of the public. Yeah, uh, Brian Strom up there has been working on those. I give him uh, little little articles. Usually they're a paragraph or two to do that. Mm -hmm. he's, he's been trying to get those in there. Um, what's really, I think, a benefit to the city now is we do have a PR person, Amanda Scott. She is really starting to, to get into doing those kinds of things. Uh, but right now with COVID and street projects and all that, you know, I'm just kind of waiting for her to call me up. Do you have an article for me yeah. uh, to do that? But the NRDs have done a really good job. I've, I've given several um, uh, articles to them. Uh, this year they decided to, uh, to not take one from Hastings, but they, you know, we're back on there for the following year. Um, and one of the areas we really want to work with is a lot of times the things that we do in town don't always get out to the farmers out there. Uh, you know, we want to do some more work with like the uh, um, like Southern Public Power and those kind of things because a lot of people do read those. Um, uh, apparently, they have really good recipes in them. So uh, you know, somebody's always reading those. I, th I think they, I think they got a great great uh, uh, kind of a catch. You know, you know, somebody's going to read it because they're looking for that recipe. I, I think it's a great idea. But uh, awesome. but we, we we're looking at trying to get into some of those other little markets and see what we can do. But uh, we've had uh, our bill stuffers out there. Uh, we do, you know, some things on uh, nitrates in your lawns, those kinds of things. Plus, uh, once a year, you will see the consumer conference or report that comes through with that bill. Thanks. I should have remembered that. <laughs> <laughs> All I know is my mom would try those uh, recipes in there. They were pretty good, you know. I just. <laughs> okay. Are there further questions? If not, I want to say a big thank you for to Tatiana and Marty for this program and uh, glad to see we were all flexible and could uh, could work this out and it is being recorded. And so it's not the audience just here today, but it will be distributed to other audiences also. So great. Well, thanks so much for having us. I really appreciate You're it. You're most welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day.